So let me go ahead. So the recording is now live. And hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Noah Lenstra, um, and I'm speaking to you from uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, and I'm so thrilled uh, to have with us today Aaron um, from, and I should have asked you this in advance, is it the Cairo Dist Area District Library? How do you put the K uh, got Cairo. Yeah, Kara, one of the, so thanks for being here. So uh, I, I heard about Erin and her work, um, uh, and I'm just putting a link in the chat. Uh, the, the, the Library of Michigan held a, a, an online symposium last November um, on next level leadership for, for small and rural libraries, the leading big um, in small spaces conference. Um, and Erin shared there um, uh, uh, a version of this presentation about how she and her library um, has really gotten started supporting uh, healthy habits. Um, and so I'm so thrilled to have Erin with us today to share share her great work uh, with, with you all and, and hopefully inspire some, some new programs and partnerships in your community. Um, before I turn things over to um, Erin, just a few quick housekeeping things. So this is, event is sponsored by Let's Move in Libraries. Um, which is really a grassroots uh, initiative with zero funding. <laughs> so really dependent upon the goodwill of people like Aaron. Um, we try to be really a catalyst for um, national and, and really international, because uh, we have quite a few Canadians involved, um, conversations about how public librarians can work with uh, their communities to promote uh, healthy communities, particular communities that um, there's access to physical activity, access to food, access to nutrition, access to really the foundation of um, of healthy healthy life um, and so uh, if if you're not already uh, subscribed uh, we do a monthly newsletter which is really uh, how we push out uh, things like the event uh, you're seeing today um, and I want to make a quick plug um, on March 16th um, at 12 p.m. Eastern time um, where we have a webinar on checking out health and wellness at the library featuring featuring librarians uh, from Indiana, Mississippi, Colorado, and California that are checking out everything from seeds uh, to exercise equipment um, to uh, some sensory uh, sensory equipment for um, uh, individuals on the autism spectrum. So I hope you'll join us for that the webinar as well. Um, and without any further ado, uh, I'm going to turn things over to Erin, um, who uh, will present um, to you her story. Uh, after that, we hope to have a, a great uh, conversation. So feel free at, at any point to put, put questions or comments into the chat. Um, and I will make sure that we bring those to Erin uh, at the end of her presentation. So thanks everyone for being here. And Erin, and uh, go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Uh, my name is Erin Schmunt. I'm the director of the Carroll Area District Library. And we are located in rural Michigan. I think I have a map here on my next slide. Of course, it's covered by my video on my screen, but we are located in what we refer to as the thumb of Michigan. We love to use our hand as a map here. Uh, I did that recently in another state and everyone looked at me like I was crazy. So Cairo is a rural agricultural community. Um, we serve about 11,800 people here at our library. And in our community, the biggest employers are a sugar beet plant, and an ethanol plant, which they take corn and turn it into ethanol, which they then put in your fuel. Um, so we have a lot of down to earth farmer types and our overall demographics trend to older adults. Michigan as a whole is aging rapidly. We are not replacing um, dying citizens with new citizens through birth. It's just definitely a very aging population in Michigan and especially in the rural areas. Uh, Cairo is the county seat of the county we're in, which is called Tuscola County. And so we tend to have a lot of the economically depressed residents of the county because there are more state and county services here. So a couple of years ago, my assistant director and I attended training through the Library of Michigan uh, from the Harwood Institute, talking about community conversations. So what that really does is we had all these mini community conversations, like 10 to 20 people at a time, and had a lot of conversations about what people wanted from their community. We don't really think about that a lot. A lot of times people complain, well, you know, the sidewalks are broken, the, there's a pothole, there's, you know, my water bill is too high, that kind of thing. But they don't spend a lot of time thinking, well, what would I like my community to be like? 
versus, you know, just without potholes or with better sidewalks or whatever. They don't think of the bigger picture. And so that was the conversation we started. And from that, we learned that there are a lot of things that people do want, even if we didn't realize it. Um, we found that we have a lot of wide open spaces here. We have lots of fields and forests and rivers and things like that. But we also have high rates of obesity, smoking, and unhealthy habits. So that sort of led us to talk about you know, what we want, how we want to change that, or what we want to do with that. And so many residents talked about they wanted opportunities to live an active, healthy lifestyle. Now, I was raised by generations and generations of farmers. These people know how to work hard. They spend a lot of time outside. But amazingly, that doesn't always necessarily mean healthy. Um, they don't necessarily exercise other than whatever hard work they're doing. And a lot of times the diet is not great. Meat and potatoes, you know, yes, some vegetables in the summer when the garden is growing, but not really necessarily paying a lot of attention to the balance of things. So our conversations led to some action in the community in that um, one of the community groups who has a series of trails and forests got together with the city and they built a way to connect their trails in the forest to the city walking paths. So that was great to come out of the conversation, but we had to start thinking about, okay, now how can the library contribute to this trend or what people actually want? Well, the good thing is they trust us. Um, why do they trust us? Because we've been teaching them things for decades. We've been teaching them how to use computers. We've been teaching them um, how to do literacy activities with their children, computer classes, craft classes, and all kinds of things like that. So for decades, we've been doing that. So they naturally sort of trust us to teach them more things. So that gave us kind of an opening. The first thing that we started out with was our walking club. Um, it honestly costs zero dollars to do. I lead it myself. It's on Tuesdays at 1215. We picked that time because it's not the first day of the week. And also it's generally during people's lunch break. So if they want to come during work time, they can come down from their lunch break. We walk for about 35 minutes um, on streets that have sidewalks. So that's a little bit difficult because our often our streets have broken up sidewalks, but I found us a path. It goes about 1.65 miles. And we have a core group that shows up every week. They are diehards. We walked this Tuesday. It was pouring rain. It was 39 degrees. There was melting ice everywhere. I was absolutely soaked when I got back, but it still felt great to get out there. They walk in the snow. They walk in the hot sun. They just love to come. Uh, we also have people who pop in and out. We have people who come when they can. We have had grandkids. We've had dogs. We've had kids in strollers. And, you know, the only cost really is staff time. And actually, we've gotten so good that our, our core walkers, um, if I'm gone on vacation, they'll just show up together and walk with whoever shows up if I can't make it for whatever reason. Uh, the next thing we started, this was one of my assistant director's ideas, is uh, we started doing meditation. And so this also does not require a lot of staff work or knowledge or training. So pre-pandemic, um, it was in person. We have a community room and it was every Wednesday at 9.30 in the morning. Uh, it was led by a staff member, but using a recorded meditation. And so there are tons of wonderful recorded meditations um, online. We've got some CDs by different gurus and you can find really excellent material. Um, we would just go in the community room with the lights out windows open but so there's low light uh, we had chairs and some yoga mats and cushions and things so people could sit however they preferred and we would normally get between two and 15 people for this um, once the pandemic hit we ended up moving this online so it's listed as Wednesdays at 9 30 but we link the recorded meditations in our Facebook events and so technically you could use these at any point in time that you can reach um, our Facebook page. The curated meditation is chosen by my assistant director and then posted in the event. We will probably at some point go back to in-person meditation, but we've really not done too much with in-person 
programming as a whole since the pandemic happened. So next, this one was super fun. Last summer, we chose to have something called logo, sorry, yoga on the lawn. And in the past, we had offered chair yoga in the community room, but again, pandemic. So we're trying to do things outside. And so we have a, a local yoga instructor that we hired. And this was, I think, the first or second day that we offered it, this little video. And you can see we have people as young as about three. And I think our oldest participant is there. She's about 80. And we had all kinds of people in between, mostly women. We did have a couple of men. And the first time we, we held it on the lawn by the road, as you can see, because it's a nice piece of lawn, but it was pretty loud. So we moved it to the other side of the library for the rest of the time. So it was more peaceful. Uh, we had six weeks, they were very well attended. And I actually this morning was texting a yoga instructor and we scheduled a session for this summer as well. And it was just definitely the highlight of my week every week because I got to do it too. Also last summer, following our theme of doing things outside to be safe, uh, we hosted Zumba in our parking lot. And uh, we had a local instructor and she was already actually doing a lot of outdoor Zumba classes in driveways and things like that because she too was trying to keep things safe. And so she came out and looked at our parking lot and we did have some cracks and things, but she would make an announcement before every class that people needed to pay attention to their surroundings and make sure that, you know, they were not any trip hazards and such. And then everybody brought water. We also provided water ourselves. And then she also would encourage participants to only do it to their ability. So we did have some participants that had some just age or injury related limitations, but they would just work to their ability and it worked out really great. We had excellent turnout. We did it four nights, four Mondays in a row. Um, one week it was 90 with 95% humidity and you know people still loved it even though it was hot. Um, we had a whole mix of experience and fitness levels. We had quite a lot of people who had never tried Zumba before. And then we also had people who um, were followers or participants with the instructor that would pretty much go to all of her classes. And so um, all of, I should mention, all of the things that I'm talking about, we offered for free. We don't charge for any programs here, which I know some libraries do. Um, the loud pulsing music, we are located weirdly in a residential neighborhood because there wasn't any land to build a library in the more commercial areas of town at the time that they built our library. So we got lots of kids riding their bikes, what's going on down there and neighbors walking out on the porch, um, but no negative complaints or anything like that. Just lots of like, huh, what's the library doing over there now? But it was still lots of fun. I did throw in a few extra things in here, Noah, because I was talking longer at this presentation than my last one. So something else that we sort of have done recently is Story Walk. And probably a lot of you have heard about that. Story Walk is where you take a book and you take it apart and post it on signs um, over a, an area, a park, your lawn, something like that. And families walk from one to the other and read the book together. It gets families out reading and moving together. Uh, we started this the summer of 2020 as something to um, something we could do. You know, the library or not library of Michigan, the state of Michigan closed us down when the lockdowns happened and the library was completely closed for three months. We couldn't even, we weren't even supposed to be coming into the building. And then after that point, we were still doing curbside and we wanted to be able to do something for the kids for summer reading. So we started with temporary story walks, one that went around the library building itself, and then one in a local park. And those ones, we bought um, the plastic signs that kind of look like campaign signs. They're about like this, and they have little metal legs. And we posted the stories on there with um, outdoor Velcro. And it worked really well. They did not hold up over time because we left them up. I mean, we put them up in June and we left them up, I think, until the next March or April. So the wind really did a number. We had to replace a lot of legs on them. But we did receive a grant from the local community foundation to install permanent story walks at both the library and the local park, which the local parks and rec group was super excited about and we've been really happy with. Um, 
Our goal normally is to change them once a month. The winter weather has been playing havoc with us lately. I have a story walk already to put out there, but everything's been frozen. So in the winter, it's going to have to be when we can unlock the cases. Um, Noah also mentioned that his next webinar talks a little bit about seed lending. So I did throw this in here too. This is something that we've been doing uh, since 2002 or 2003. It was before I came here and my assistant director who started it can't remember when she started it. So we've been doing it nine or 10 years. And we started with donations from seed companies. And then as residents got good at this and saving seeds, they started donating from their own gardens. Um, we normally open it up in March for the new season and hand out seeds for whatever people want. They can take, we encourage them to take about 10 so that they have enough to share. You know, everyone has enough to share, but we generally have tons and tons of seeds. So it's not too big of a deal. Um, we have an event the first day that we open it so people can come and ask questions about seed saving or maybe what kinds of, if heirloom seeds work better for what they're trying to do. And then after that, we park it out in the regular part of the library and people can stop anytime that we're open and check out seeds. They're encouraged to bring them back, but some things are very challenging to save seeds for. So we don't, you know, we don't require them to bring them back. Um, along with the seed lending library, we have something called the Homegrown Food Series. And this is something that we started in 2004. Melissa plans classes. Uh, she's in the picture there watering her gardens outside. She plans classes to go along with the seed library. We teach people how to save seeds, how to garden. And then we have other speakers about things like beekeeping or cooking. Always a lot of people asking for food preservation. And then we have five square foot gardens outside our library. And we use those to save seeds, grow seeds, uh, grow produce. And then any leftover produce that we're not using ourselves for cooking classes or possibly um, saving seeds for, we do share with the public. So we'll sometimes put a sign on a table with a big stack of tomatoes and anybody can come get them if they'd like. Um, so here's my advice, how to offer more wellness programs. So start with something you or your other staff members know about or are interested in. Um, personally, I do yoga pretty often and I love Zumba. I, had, I just think it's totally fun. And so I'm enthused about it. I love to share knowledge about it. Um, if you're confident in your knowledge, lead it yourself. That would be probably the cheapest option if that's a concern. Uh, it generally is sometimes here. But also you could possibly find a community partner or a local instructor. Um, our local instructors we pay, but we also sometimes do classes with MSU Extension. Um, that's the Michigan State University, which is our land grant college in the state of Michigan. Every state, I believe, has one, and they generally offer um, expertise and agricultural related programming, a lot of times nutrition or um, animals. I know they did our chicken class and things like that for free. So wh whatever your land grant colleges in your state, it'd be a good idea to possibly hook up with those people because they that's their job is to offer these things, and so they do it for free. So that's great too. Um, my other advice is just try it out. If you do it and it doesn't work, then you don't do it again. Um, I know people sometimes get a little bit leery about trying things out, but I'm, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You just don't do it again then. Um, all right, I guess I'm up to questions. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks so much, Erin. Um, and we got uh, a number of questions that I was writing down. I think uh, in your last slide, you addressed one of them about kind of where where instructors come from. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'll just start back back at the beginning. Uh, when you were talking about your walking club, uh, there was a question about uh, what you all discuss. Do you have themes? Uh, do you have is it do you have um, yeah, set topics that kind of you use to facil facilitate conversation or do you find something like that to be required or yeah tell us tell us more about what what it actually looks like during the walk-in uh, clubs sure um in the winter it's generally just my diehards and so they've gotten to know each other pretty well over the last eight years so a lot of times they're asking questions about you know they know what everybody was planning on doing over the last week if somebody was going to 
uh, a new, we have one lady who loves house plants. And so she's always visiting nurseries. And so somebody will ask about new plants that she bought. And, and it's not, it's normally more about personal connection, which the one lady uh, moved here from Seattle just before I became the director here. And she always tells us that the library saved her life when she moved here because it's a very different atmosphere here versus Seattle politically, socially. And so she was very lost when she came. So she finds that um, this is something that's of great benefit to her. Uh, when we have people who are new, a lot of times it's kind of a getting to know you. We don't really do themes, but sometimes they ask questions about, you know, things they see that the library is going to be offering, or if there's something going on in town, like a new building being built. Um, they always, we always pay a lot of attention to the houses we pass on our walk. Um, there have been several times where they've been renovating a, a house and often the owners will invite us in for a tour. That's been pretty fun. Uh, there's a bed and breakfast that uh, recently purchased another house that was on our path. And so we got to tour that when they had it all finished. And so uh, mostly local things that we pay attention, either the participants or what we're seeing on our walks. No, thanks for sharing that. And I love that quote, the library saved my life. Um, and that really illustrates uh, um, that when libraries do these kind of healthy classes, um, they can impact not only people's physical health, but all, physical health, but also their mental and social well-being. Um, and we know that for so many, just the opportunity to, to be out and connected with others has those, those social and mental benefits as well. So thank you for sharing that. Um, uh, there was another question relating to the walking. Um, there was someone interested in doing a Couch to 5K program and was wondering if you had any books uh, or book recommendations uh, that, that you find um, helpful in terms of inspiring people to walk or hike or just be active outside. Um, uh, yeah, have you ever tried to weave kind of your, your collection into some of these programming and if you have any, any recommendations for books that people may, may want to check out? I have woven uh, books into some of the other um, the other ones, but not Walking Club because we don't even come inside. So I don't even think to incorporate other than some of the people in our Walking Club are in my book club. So sometimes we end up talking about the book for book club. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a Couch to 5K recommendation. I've seen them and looked at them, but I don't have any off the top of my head. Sure, and that's that's totally fine. And and I have I have something I'll put in the chat, or <laughs> you, the, the person can also email me who asked that question because I've seen some libraries that have done that. Um, but back to uh, so a number of people were super curious in your story walk, uh, and 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 just uh, two couple. I know you had mentioned the funder, but um, I didn't write it down, so others may be interested in and in who funded it. Um, and also, where did you actually get the signs? Was it barking dog exhibits or pannier? Or yeah, tell us more about kind of the signs and the funding for the story walk? Sure. The story walk was funded by our local community foundation. It's the Tuscola County Community Foundation. They fund projects that are local to the county and the fund that we received it from specifically funds often um, Caro, the city. And um, they were willing to pay for two full story walks. Uh, the one is right here at the library. It starts right outside our front door. I don't know why I'm gesturing with my hands. You probably can't see that. Um, and it winds all the way around the library in our flower beds. And then the second one is located in a park in town that also has a big um, playground and a splash pad. So it's a great spot that families are probably already going and it gives them an additional activity to do. Uh, we did purchase them from Barking Dog Exhibits. I have been extremely happy with them. We purchased the ones that are completely metal. The frame is metal, the post is metal because especially the one that's not located at the library, um, there aren't always eyes on it. And we just wanted to make sure it was as vandalism proof as possible. Um, I, the way that the frames secure and everything works great. The only thing I'm finding is in the winter, if, if we've had some freezing thawing, then if it's still freezing, we can't necessarily get into them easily without freezing our fingers off. Um, but I don't know that there's a really good solution for that. But overall, we've been very, very happy with them. Yeah, that's great to hear. And I was also really pleased that you mentioned this has been a, a really fruitful collaboration with your, your Parks and Recreation Department as well. Um, 
Um, and just uh, going through, we had a few more questions come in. So just uh, in general, when you're doing Zumba or yoga or even walking, um, do you have participants sign a waiver of liability? Is that at all a concern in your community? How have you addressed that? We do not have them um, sign a waiver of liability. I talked to our insurance company about that and they did not require it. So we don't. Um, luckily, we haven't been in a position where we had an injury. Um, so we don't require one. Uh, actually, the I take that back. The yoga instructor required one for herself, but that was just something she keeps. We don't have any hand in it. Yeah, and thanks, thanks for sharing that, Erin. And, and I think um, that, that is a good point. So just to check with your insurance provider, I think sometimes there is that fear. But um, uh, in my research, I've been talking with librarians offering these classes, uh, in some cases for years. Uh, and, and I've never heard of any anyone suing the library. Um, I mean, never, no, knock on wood, but <laughs> yeah, I think, um, yeah, uh, I think uh, so. Um, just uh, so back to the walking, we have a question here about um, uh, uh, different abilities. Do you, has there ever been an issue where some people are stronger walkers or, or more beginning walkers than others? Uh, has kind of keeping everyone at the same speed ever been an issue? Um, or has that been something you've had to deal with at all? We definitely have people of differing abilities. Like I said, my hardcore walkers are pretty much at the same level. Um, the funny thing is they're in their 70s and 80s. But um, sometimes if we get people with dogs or small children, or we have had some people, um, our local human development corporation had brought some people that they were sort of mentoring into healthier lifestyles. And generally our group is pretty good about going at the speed of whoever's the slowest. Um, normally we do have had a situation where like, one of the faster people got in the front of the group and then sort of didn't pay attention that everyone else was going slower. But once they noticed, they slowed right down. We did also have one issue where um, one of the group that was coming from the Human Development Corporation got overheated and almost not heat stroke, but tending towards that. Luckily, our path takes us past the local community hospital. And so we walked over to the hospital, went into the lobby, which was air conditioned. It was, it was quite a warm day in the summer. And then, um, you know, she sat down for a while and rested and we got her water and, and things were fine there. Um, people are pretty nice normally. If they're coming to a group like this, they want a human connection with other people. And so they're generally willing, you know, they're not out here training for a 5k or a 10k or a marathon. They just want somebody to walk with and chat with and kind of social and health benefits. Yeah, um, yeah, and, and yeah, and thanks for reiter re reiterating again, it's not just the physical benefits, it's the social social benefits as well. Um, and um, and uh, let, let me just, uh, so I think, I've, unless I've uh, missed something, I think that's uh, all the questions. Uh, there's been some great resource sharing around Couch to 5K and, and other, other kind of informational resources. I'd be really curious, so you had mentioned that the Seed Library was started uh, prior to you coming to the library. Um, uh, yeah, tell us a little bit more about kind of um, uh, relationship building in the community. Um, did your library already have uh, a good relationship with Parks and Recreation? I know sometimes that can be a sticking point where historically there's been some, some division or tension and, and, and you also mentioned working with uh, Michigan State University Extension. Just, just tell us a little bit more about kind of your process of kind of building up and connecting with these, these different local and, and state partners. Okay. Our seed library was started prior to me being at the library a couple of years. And that started by my assistant director. She reached out to local, or not local, but seed companies, heirloom seed companies to start the collection initially. Uh, once she started the uh, homegrown food series, which was a couple years later, then that was where we really started forming a relationship with the Michigan State University Extension Office. And they've done probably 40% of our homegrown food series classes for us. Um, you know, at least in Michigan, it's that's their job is to share this information and teach people how to do these things. And so they're very pleased to work with us because we have an audience for them. And we're pleased to work with them because they have knowledge to share with us. So that has been a great partnership. 
Uh, Parks and Rec in Cairo, uh, <laughs> we are a city, but we've only been a city for like 10 years. We were the largest village in Michigan for, I don't know, a hundred and some years. And so Parks and Rec is sort of a newer concept here and it doesn't have any staff. They just have a committee and they have some money. And so when somebody else in the community is doing something, like they recently partnered with the schools to, to build some tennis courts, that's kind of a, but again, I think the schools supplied most of the impetus to get it going. They mostly supplied some money and you know some approvals. And so they were super happy when we approached them about the story walk, putting it in their park, because again, it was another activity that would be for families to do in the park. They didn't actually have to, well, the DPW actually installed all of the story walks for us. So that was a good partnership there as well. But Parks and Rec was, was happy to do it. Um, they did approach us. We do have a library of things, which I didn't mention in my thing because I didn't think to tie it in, but they did approach us just recently. They would like, they're building pickleball courts down in the park and they would like us to circulate some pickleball equipment hopefully starting this summer. And so they're gonna be purchasing that equipment and we'll catalog it and be in charge of it. We already, there's a disc golf course at that same park where the story walk is. And we already circulate um, disc golf equipment and some other things for the parks. So I think that could be a, a fruitful partnership going forward. They just move a lot slower because they don't, like I said, there's no staff at Parks and Rec. It's all done through committee of volunteers. Sorry, you muted myself. Yeah, that that's really interesting. Um, and what I love about that as well, is, and just uh, is just how how things snowball. Um, it's kind of you get started doing one thing, and and that kind of leads to uh, something else, and and then the library just be, becomes really known uh, in the community as as kind of a partner. Um, and uh, I'd love to just uh, take things back to the beginning. So you had mentioned the Harwood Institute, um, and they're kind of. Uh, Tell us, how did you get connected with that? Like, how did, how is that something that, um, that you learned about or, or decided to bring to your library? Sure. Uh, the Library of Michigan, which is like the state library entity for Michigan, um, they had a partnership with this group that's called MCLS. It's like the Midwest Collaborative for Library Services, I think is what it stands for. And they had gone together and were funding um, the Harwood Institute training for public libraries across Michigan. And then I think they branched out into Indiana as well. And they were putting out, you know, to see who wanted to join the cohort to think about turning outward. And really, um, since I've been here and actually never ever has my library ever had a strategic plan. And I would really like us to have a strategic plan, but my board really doesn't want to have a strategic plan that probably isn't good to put on this webinar. But anyways, they don't want to put any work into it. So I was looking for a way to possibly create a strategic plan. And so I thought this turning outward and finding out what the community wants would be a good way of doing it. Side note, we still don't have a strategic plan, but we did, uh, we were able to generate an entire report, not necessarily about what the library wants from the, I'm sorry, what the community wants from the library, but what the community wants from the community. And I don't know, I think I do have a slide after this. Um, if I send you these, Noah, can you post them somewhere? Because I actually have some links. Yeah, absolutely. I, I have okay. Some in. Okay, so I have a link in here um, that talks about what the Harwood Institute does with libraries. And then there's a link also to the report that we generated from all of our um, community conversations. And then um, MCLS and Library of Michigan were super excited because some actual projects resulted from our community conversations. So they produced a video. So there's a video on here about that. And then I also um, put a link to Michigan State University Extension, which is only probably of benefit to those of you in Michigan, but um, the rest of you might be able to find your land grant college. And so, yeah, the Harwood Institute training was great. It was an immense amount of work. We did. I think 20 community conversations over the course of three or four months. And so it was a lot of sitting and talking to people, which was great, but you know, you also have to do your regular job as well. So, um, but it was, the benefits were wonderful. We're, we're still seeing the benefits. People still think of us as a place that they can um, talk to, to get things done. 
Yeah, no, that that's great. And thanks for uh, these links. And, and I hear people in the chat uh, really appreciative. And I know I can't wait to check out this video. I'm definitely going <laughs> to check it out uh, later today. Um, so you had mentioned a minute ago about how Harwood uh, going through the whole profit it does take some time and in addition to everything else that you're doing. And, and I think uh, a lot of librarians, especially now during COVID-19 are, are worried about burnout um, and trying to tackle too much. Um, and so in, as you and your library do all of these, uh, what, what are some ways that you find um, to kind of sustain yourself and keep yourself going and, and kind of prevent, prevent burnout, if that makes sense? Sure. Um, we definitely over COVID have scaled back what we've been doing um because first of all again we're we're still not really doing and i mean we still do walking club but that's outside and overall have not been doing a lot of in-person programming um we're just starting to talk about it as the weather changes we're hoping to spend as much time outside this year as possible um so scaling back what you're doing um i really thought that the public would maybe grumble at some point about that and they have not said a peep they're just super excited that we're still doing some things. So um, I think sometimes we put more expectations on ourselves than people actually have for us. So, you know, maybe do one less thing. And, you know, if nobody screams about it, then, you know, you're fine. Take your time. Um, other than that, I've, I've learned the, the value of disconnection. I, at the moment, do not have my work email on my phone. And I have I'm probably going to have to put it back on there, but it's been really lovely to be at my house and not have to think about it. Um, I'm also probably not a good person to ask about this because I'm fine with doing a lot of stuff. I like to do a lot of stuff. It keeps me busy, but yeah, but I, I think in a way, I mean, it's I, I think part of the answer is is finding finding what what uh, kind of keeps you excited and and for some people keeping busy keeps <laughs> yeah, but it's uh, it'll different from different to playing to your strengths um and and just uh, uh I have a, a comment here uh, about the hardwood um uh so after you did those initial conversations um have you have you tried to continue kind of um uh continue to engage your community through community conversations or other methods um yeah what, what uh, have you found any ways to kind of uh keep that kind of community like library dialogue going after the initial community conversations if that makes sense we have done some surveys and things like that but we haven't gone back to the conversations especially at this point because you really do have to be in person mm -hmm. um i in my opinion i i don't think it would work well well especially our rural community does not take very well to virtual things. Um, we actually, we did some virtual programming for adults over the um, pandemic, the height of the pandemic, but definitely not for kids. And you're only gonna get certain people doing it that way. And so, and not very many. Uh, it's really something that, you know, you need to be in a room to forge a relationship, to get to know the people a little bit. And so we have not gone back to that. Um, it is something I'd be interested in doing in the future. We have been approached. Um, so because the city just formed 10 years ago, when this, I don't know how much of you, I don't even know how this works in other states, but we have townships. So each county is divided up into townships. And then um, sometimes there are villages or cities within those townships. Well, when you have a village, the village is still part of the township, but when you have a city, that piece of property or that land is carved out of the township. And so when the city formed 10 years ago, the surrounding townships lost tons of land and tons of property value and tons of tax income. And so the townships are still kind of angry at the city about that. And so the city is interested in starting more conversations with them. And they have asked the library to um, run kind of the community conversation style conversations with the city and the township, um, but so far have not been successful in getting the townships to agree to sit down for that. So uh, that's something where we would just basically act as the MC, the mediator, the whatever you want to call it, the impartial judge. I don't know what you want to call it, but um, it hasn't actually happened. But no, we haven't really been having community conversations other than through electronic means, until the pandemic is, I mean, theoretically we're on the downswing, but who knows what's going to happen. 
No, yeah, and thanks, thanks for sharing that. And, and it is kind of interesting as well, just thinking about kind of how, how the library could be a mediator or kind of a facilitator of, of conversations uh, as, as, as these things happen. Um, and just uh, going back to the questions, uh, a couple of people are asking about the library of things, uh, really interested in that. Uh, so um, uh, you, you had your seed collection and yeah, tell us a little bit more about uh, any, any kind of unique items that you may, may check out or circulate and, and how do you get those items? You get them from your, your collection budget, other sources, tell us, tell us more about that. Sure. Uh, we really started the library of things here probably four or five years ago in our children's collection. The first things that we really circulated down there, sorry, down there because it's in our lower level, um, were a couple of ukuleles, a lap harp, and snap circuits. Um, and the snap circuits were crazy popular. Actually, now the ukuleles I practically can't keep on the shelf. Um, the snap circuits were initially purchased out of our library collection budget, but since that time, we've had some donations of, you know, families, their kids got older and didn't use them anymore. And so we put those into the collection. We did also purchase the uh, lap harp and the ukuleles out of our collection budget. They're really not very expensive. I think the ukuleles were under $30 a piece. And um, the kit has the ukulele, a book on how to play the ukulele, and then we do put a tuner in there. I don't know if they use it or not, but there's one in there. And that's where it started. And then as we went on, we sort of decided to add some more things. They also have some puzzles and games. And again, some of them, it was a combination of um, things we purchased and things that we've had donated. And there's some puzzles and games in the children's area. And then our Friends of the Library group has been very generous, especially in funding the adult part of the Library of Things. Uh, they purchased for the kids area some baking kits, um, marble mazes, and what was the other one at the same time? Oh, ice cream. Uh, there's these little ice cream makers that's like a little ball and you put all the stuff in and the kids like roll the ball around and it makes ice cream. And then that, that was in the children's area. And then the adult library of things, they really started us out with $500. And it's amazing what you can actually buy with $500. We bought the disc golf kits, we have cornhole. The cornhole boards go out all the time in the summer. We have a set of bocce balls. Um, I'm trying to picture, oh, we have a food dehydrator. We have an Instapot. We have rubber stamps. We have a, a one of our friends of the library is huge into stamping up and that kind of thing. And they gave us a bunch of rubber stamps that we circulate. Um, we have a telescope, a microscope, um, oh, we started with seasonal affective disorder lamps. That was actually the very first thing we had in the adult library of things. And those circulate very heavily in the winter. Michigan has a lot of gray days in the winter. And so we started those probably four years ago. I think we have 10 or so. Um, and then also with a grant through Library of Michigan over the pandemic, we started Wi-Fi hotspots. Those we can't keep on the shelf. Um, I have 10 Chromebooks sitting in my office being ready to be cataloged. Those are going to be going out. Um, I know there's a few other things, but I'm not remembering what they are at the moment. Sure, and that, that's totally fine. And, and that, that may have a, a good segue to kind of uh, wrapping things up because uh, as I mentioned at the top of the hour, our next webinar um, <laughs> on March 16th is gonna be all about checking out health and wellness. So, so it'll be a great time to really dig into these questions about uh, collection development and maintenance um, and sustainability of um, these, these uh, circulation of objects uh, in libraries. Um, so uh, sign up for that. Um, and I uh, just wanted to put another quick uh, link uh, into the, the newsletter. Um, and uh, thanks, Aaron, for putting your contact information here. Um, and Aaron, if you send me your slides, um, I will then uh, uh, get that along with uh, the webinar recording posted. And I'll, I'll send that out to all the registrants uh, either later today um, or, or early tomorrow. Um, but. Um, I want to thank uh, everyone for coming today, um, in particular thanks to Aaron for uh, sharing your story um, and all of this amazing uh, content. Um, 
I, I think Aaron, uh, you you hit it on the the the, the um, on the nose uh, when when you talked about boundaries and not having your work email. So in the spirit of boundaries, uh, we're going to end right on time at one forty five. Um, but I want to thank everyone again for your time and and definitely follow up with Aaron um, if you have uh, any additional questions. Um, and I can't wait to check out this video. So so thanks for sharing that. Um, so thanks everyone uh, and have a good uh, rest of your day. Thank you.